Good morning. Sound check. Can you hear in the back? Can you hear me? All right. A little bit higher. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Wonderful. Dean, can you hear me? All right. Maybe even a little louder. Okay. We're good now. Excellent. Thank you. Well, good morning. I welcome you to this worship service in the name of Jesus Christ. As you may have noticed out front, if you weren't here last week, we have a fun way to share our witness of Advent with the community. Harold has made us beyond a life-size Advent wreath, and you can see it from the road. So please feel free to take photos of it. Maybe one day we'll even put like the words that go on the handles, but right now it's just this nice, uh, beautiful uh, shadow outline of the Advent wreath. It's kind of fun. There are, I, I shared it with a lot of clergy women. I'm in an online thing for clergy women. 400 of them across the United States were very impressed with Harold's handiwork. <laughs> they all said he was amazing. I said, yes, yes, he is. So, anyway, it's been fun to share that with others. We have Advent calendars uh, still in the narthex. If you want to take one with you, it gives you some kind of action uh, to do every day in the season so you can get into the mood of Advent. Uh, also back in the narthex are the Upper Rooms for January, February, the Ola Magazine. Um, I think that's all that's back there. We are excited that next week, at the third Sunday of Advent, we are going to be having an all-music worship service. It will highlight our choir. I know there are those of you who will not want to miss that. I know that we have some people who it's difficult for them to come to church, but they are making a special effort to come next week for all the music. So I know that you will want to, to be here for that. EJ still has scads of skeins of yarn available, so see her if you need those. So, there you go. We on okay. The Wonderful. And I could see there were a lot of people that would use our blankets. They were yes. really sad and, and, and weary. And so I thought, these are going to Friday. They were 15 of them. I kept them back. Good. So that's here. But um, like if somebody got a friend from the church. Right. But, uh, I, I just felt proud of our lady and, and every
it's just it's a wonderful ministry for us to be able to offer that to, to veterans. Uh, Bible study continues on uh, Saturday evenings in Spanish. Are there other announcements? Yes, Debbie. Yes, and that was in the newsletter. Yes. So, anything else? Yes. In the newsletter, it was also mentioned that during December we'll be doing a love offering for our staff to show them how much we appreciate them, and it will be through next Sunday also. Anything else? Well, let us continue to worship God using our call to worship that is in the bulletin. If life was a home, then we would pray. May love be the foundation. May God be the cornerstone. May the spirit be the windows ushering light in. And may hope be the walls holding us together. In this hour of worship, let us work toward building that home together. We may not know the path ahead, but God is here even now. Let us give thanks for a foundation of love. Let us worship holy God. Today's Advent candle lighting is peace, and Ann Barnett and Betsy Walker are going to light the candle for us. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. And I won't make Sarah come up and do this again. I will light my own second candle on my stool. And as we concentrate on peace, let us stand and sing together. In the faith we sing, I've got peace like a river.
And you may be seated. And we, as we move into a time of prayer where we share our joys and concerns, I lift the prayer list that is on the back of your bulletin. I want to say, welcome back. We're delighted to see you to Karen Grayson, who is here this morning. We're so pleased with your recovery so far, and we continue to hold you in prayer. It is good to hear your voice. Kathy, how's John feeling? Not the same. Okay. Yeah, he, has, uh, he had a CT scan Friday. Okay. And we'll go back next Friday for another study. Okay. Okay, well, let's continue to remember John as, as he has to wait for test results to find out things. Are there others that you would like to lift this morning specifically? Yes, for sure. I know we want to continue to remember Linda Bellamy's mother. Um, Louise. Renfro. is not doing well. All right, so Louise Renfro's brother, Eugene. I want to lift my friend Sue, who has a mass in her midsection and is at Duke, and she is undergoing tests to find out what is going on. Ann Reed. Ann Reed, and Gary too. Um, the, the dialysis continues to take a toll on him, um, although Vernie saw him in out, out and about, which is good news. Uh, but Anne really is, she's just had some uh, frustrations with needing to have blood work done again and again in order for her um, body to be able to withstand the CT scan that um, will then lead to surgery. So we just want to keep her in our prayers. Yes? My neighbor, Jim Adcock. Jim Adcock. Okay, upcoming surgery. I don't know. Yes, Patsy. My friend, my friend, uh, friend the dentist is having surgery Tuesday. Surgery on Tuesday for your friend the dentist. Certainly. Do you all know the name Wesley Johnson? Does that do you know who Wesley is? So Wesley lives in the neighborhood across the street from the church, across Central Avenue. His dad was a United Methodist minister, and he is, I, I don't know how much connection he had here, but he is, um, uh, he has very fond um, feelings for our church. Wesley is a movie scout, and he is the reason that we landed the movie deal uh, back in the spring. He is the one who recommended our space to uh, the Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret movie. And so it was his connections that led the way for us being able to participate in that. And I've, I've reached out to him um, uh, just to touch base with him. Both of his parents passed away last winter, and so we had gotten information about that. Um, as, uh, as retired Methodist ministers, uh, that information is shared with current ministers. So I'd known about his father's death. His mother also passed away. About a week ago, his oldest brother, Kenneth Jr., had a heart attack and died. In addition to that, his girlfriend, a longtime relationship who lives with him, her mother uh, died about a month ago, 
and um, was living in Panama, and they're having difficulty moving her remains, her ashes, back to the United States. Um, he and his, his, his other brother, who lives with him and Mary as well, has been diagnosed with stage one prostate cancer. So he has just had more than anyone should bear in the past nine to 12 months, but especially as of late. And so I just want to lift him. I, I want you to keep him in mind. And while he is not technically uh, a part of this church, um, I, I know he feels a great sense of belonging here. And so I, I feel like I, I take care of him a little too. So anyway, I just want to, to lift Wesley Johnson, Wes. Are there others? Yes, Ann. Yeah. Yes. They do have a new great grandbaby in their lives. <laughs> yes, so we want to continue to remember Pam and Bo, but especially Bo in his struggles. Are there others that you'd like to lift? allowed. If you don't, if you just have a concern that you know it's on your heart, if you want to raise a hand, we know to keep you in mind. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. God of the days of old and God of the here and now, we come to you in this very present moment this morning grateful for the opportunity to gather in your name. And Lord, as we concentrate on the idea of peace this morning, we boldly claim peace in this world in your name. Lord, you have heard the names that we have lifted the people that we have said aloud this morning, those who are facing surgery, those who are facing testing, those who are simply waiting for test results or waiting to have tests done. You know that sense of uncertainty, that sense of frustration, that sense of longing for an inner peace. Lord, know that there are those who we did not even speak aloud today who remain on our hearts, and you know who all of those are. Be in each situation that we named and that we have in our minds and hearts. Lord, as we look within our congregation and then beyond our congregation, there are those who suffer, there are those who simply need a word of grace. Help us to see those situations, to be wherever it is that you would have us to be and to go in order to represent you, to represent your Son in this world. And as we gather this morning, as we lift our prayers, Remind us of the blessings that we have, that we can gather, that our health is good enough to be here, that our financial situation is stable. Please, O oh Lord, continue to sustain us. And we offer all of these prayers this morning in the name of your precious child, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Amen.
Let us take a moment and uh, bless the offerings that, uh, that we have given. Uh, so let us pray. Gracious God, these are but a token of what we have been given. We offer these gifts, these tithes, these offerings back to you. Use them for the inbreaking of your kingdom in this place and throughout the world. Amen. Y'all, just look around. Isn't it beautiful in here? Yeah. Look at those big, amazing velvet. Who knew they made velvet poinsettias? They came from the movie. It's just delightful to see the Chrismon tree, and you will see our lovely nativity. You will notice that the wise men come a little closer every week. I won't say how that happens. I just want you to notice that they are making a journey, but they're not there yet. It's just beautiful to be in here. And I think, especially after last year, when we couldn't gather, I just feel ever so much more grateful for, for the time that we can gather now. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke in the first chapter, verses 57 through 80. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord has shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, None of your relatives has his name. Then they began to motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue freed, and he began to speak praising God. Fear came over all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, what then will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord was with him. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We know that when something hits close to home, it's intense. And Advent is full of intensity. 
as we concentrate on this larger theme of being close to home for this season of Advent, we looked at being homesick last week. Homesick for a person, a place, a time that is no longer within reach. And as we continue to looking, looking at ideas related to home, this week we shift to this passage about the birth of John the Baptist. We're talking about the foundation of home, an eternal home, truly, but a home nonetheless. Most Advent cycles have the reading of John the Baptist preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. We read about John as an adult running around in strange clothes, stirring up folks to look for a savior. And this year, I'm looking at the birth of John as a preparation in and of itself for the birth of Jesus. So we read this passage of Elizabeth giving birth, this amazing story that's kind of tinged with miracles itself. And then we read this lovely canticle, this, this beautiful piece of poetry, this song from, from baby John's father, Zechariah. He basically sings a prophecy, a prediction, a naming, a claiming of what is to come. And in this birth story, when we are normally thinking about a different birth story in Advent, but in this birth story, the one that precedes Jesus, we see that foundation of what is to come. And we, we get a better sense of, of how interwoven this story, John's story, is with Jesus's birth story. They're not just a few months apart. They're not just cousins. They are part and parcel of one another. Their lives, even here at the very, very beginning, their lives are interdeveloped with one another, one leading to the other, one preparing the way, both in birth and in life. So this foundation for John's life that is set out by his father Zechariah in this prophetic song, this forms the basis of what John is called to do, and consequently, what Jesus is called to do. So we have this beautiful piece of poetry here in the first very beginning chapter of Luke, and it outlines all this gratitude. What have we been doing in, in our season of gratitude, our, our time of concentrating on our blessings in November? We, ha we are into that mindset of that, that gratitude business. And, and what is Zechariah doing? He is talking about gratitude towards God for, for, for generations, for having looked on Israel with blessing for a long time. This prophetic song, it names the mercy that is shown by God, the covenant that is set out by God, the relationship that God has with Abraham. So it's this historic piece. Zechariah is giving us a history and putting John into the context of all this history. So his prophecy is about the, the promise of God, recognizing that to the ancestors, and then it just sets forth the whole trajectory of John's life. He talks about his own child, this child, this new being on the planet. He, he calls this child a prophet. He says he will go before the Lord and that he himself will be the preparation, the preparation for a savior. And remember, in the actual book of Luke, this passage is just after Zechariah regains his voice, the, the song, the prophecy, right after he can speak again. So he was struck without speech. He lost his ability to talk earlier in the very first part of the book of Luke. Basically, he had just expressed doubt about him and his wife's ability to have children. And then you've got the angel Gabriel who goes, look, I have spoken. I have said that Elizabeth will have a child and you will name him John. But since you doubt me, 
You will not speak again until these things have come to pass. And so it does. And it comes to pass that Zechariah and Elizabeth do have a child. And remember, Zechariah, you, you can actually see how he's adapted to his situation. He's, he's coping with his inability to speak. He, he lost his voice because of his unbelief, but he's still, he's a priest, remember, so he's, he's educated, so he can, um, he can read and write. He can, he asks for the tablet, he writes on it. His name is John, and everyone is amazed. And they kind of go, ooh, all right, because immediately he can speak again. He basically backs his wife's decision um, to, and reinforces her decision to follow Gabriel's declaration to name the child John. And then what happens? Well, he can talk. So that sets off all the buzz through really the whole neighborhood. Uh, so his imagination comes back, his creativity comes back, Zachariah gets his voice and, and gets his feet under him again. And so he offers praise, and, and priests would have done some of this, but, but he offers this song of praise for God's mercy. He prophesies about the hope he has for his own child. And as you notice, this, this mysterious thing has happened to Zechariah, and then fear kind of hits the neighborhood. And they're all like, ooh, what happened over there? Mm, did you hear about that? And you can just tell that there's just gossip going through the hills uh, of Judea. Folks are just a buzz talking about this. So if you think about how Zechariah came to this point, he basically lost his voice until, to use today's um, vernacular, until he decentered himself, until he took himself out of the story. It wasn't, it, he kind of realized, you know, this isn't so much about me. It's not even really about my child. It's about God and what God is doing in human history. And, and Zechariah recognizes that, that God is calling Zechariah and Elizabeth and John to participate in this greater scheme, this greater participation, this, this working out the purpose of God. And Zechariah names that in this prophecy. Now, because we're on this side of things, you know, we, we, we know how the story ends. We are, here we are, we're, we're post Jesus's birth, we're post Jesus's resurrection, we're post the whole New Testament. And so we can forget what it must have been like to be there then. Think about the fact that John came into this world before Jesus with, with all the hope and love that a baby brings with it. And, and so we've got Elizabeth and Zechariah not knowing exactly the whole Jesus story. They don't really know what's coming, but they, they shared this vision of having a child in whatever was considered their old age. They shared this vision for their child, not understanding quite how he would pave the way for his cousin's life and death and, of course, eventual resurrection. But still they were able to acknowledge that God was doing something greater than, than even they could understand. So John will prepare a way for Jesus, and that guides all of us towards peace, because Jesus becomes this beacon of peace for all humanity. So John is the embodiment of preparation for peace. John's life becomes the foundation of our home, as we talk about an eternal home. Zechariah is singing this song to his child, about his child, on his very first day in the world. And so I got to thinking, uh, what, what would you say to a brand new great grandbaby? What would you say to a new being that has just arrived on the planet? There was a really cute video that I worked hard, Jack worked really, really hard to see if we could get to show you, but the technological and copyright laws um, were, were not in our favor. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this cute video. It was done by Kid President. I don't know if any of you remember watching some Kid President things probably six or eight years ago, might have been longer ago that, than that now. Um, time tends to have a different meaning as I get older. But he was just this really cute kid 
um, who would put on these very um, uh, positive and empowering videos. He has one out there for moms that I always really liked. But he has this one video, and it, it talks about what would you say to someone on their first day here. He, he talks about that what your job is when you get here, and that your job is to breathe. And so he breathes in and out. And, and your job is to dance, and so he dances. And your job is to love and eat corn dogs. It's a really cute video. If you ever are out there in the interwebs, uh, Google kid president and, and first day here, it's, it's really, it's adorable. But, but think about what, what would you say to someone just being born? Welcome to the world. Good things happen, terrible things happen. It's all okay, we're in it together. How would you describe to someone just arriving what that, the, the journey holds ahead. Being here, being incarnate as we are, being present in the world, it's certainly about laughter. It's certainly about la dancing. It might even be about corn dogs. I don't know. But being here is definitely about showing love to others. Being here is about peace, creating and bringing peace to the world, just as Jesus does in his very incarnation. The foundation of our home, of our community, is peace. John the Baptist paves the way for Jesus, who prepares, he prepares us for Jesus' coming into the world, and Jesus comes to bring peace. And how does peace get here? We know that peace comes through justice and mercy. The idea of peace doesn't just show up with the waving of a magic wand. It doesn't always come in a nice, neat little package all wrapped up in a bow and set underneath a tree either. Peace, whether it's global peace or inner peace, peace is often hard fault. Hard one, not easy. John the Baptist's life may have started all beautiful and such, but it certainly didn't end that way. He was compelled to tell the truth and to make a way for Jesus, and that journey did not come to a peaceful end for him. But his presence, his proclamations, his preparation for a Savior was necessary and needed. And as the text says, the child, John, grew and became strong in spirit. May all our children be so strong in spirit. John's strength was crucial to prepare for Jesus' sacrifice. Zechariah's very words lift up this idea of peace. Today we have lit various peace candles. What is a good foundation of home? Peace. What is the prophecy of Zechariah? Peace. To guide our feet into the way of peace, it says in the text. And how do we get to peace? Justice and mercy. We work for justice, we show mercy, we usher in peace. They are inextricably linked and reliant on one another. And when we take one another's concerns seriously, when we help those who suffer from inequality or lack of a voice in their own lives, we move toward justice. When we attend the needs of others, even those whom we do not associate with usually, we are moving toward mercy. When we take care of our neighbors, not just those who live geographically and physically beside us, but neighbors with whom we share this planet, we move toward mercy, building that as a foundation for home. So taking on issues of justice and doing acts of mercy brings us toward peace. Speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves, that's an act 
That's an act of justice that leads to peace. So peace is the foundation of our home, and it's important that we build on that foundation, that we shore up those walls, that we move toward covering the vulnerable with care, and that we put ourselves in solidarity with those with whom we share community, those who are around us, those that we see, those that we interact with every day, and those that are well beyond our purview and what, who we actually talk to. May today be a day of building peace, of creating justice, of moving toward mercy and ushering in peace, one act of mercy and justice at a time. Amen and amen. Our closing hymn, Keeping with Our Theme of Peace, is found in the United Methodist Hymnal on 431. Let us stand and sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. And now, beloved, let us go forth from this place in the name of the God who gives us life, the Christ who gives us love, and the Spirit who gives us peace. Amen.